when I have given a, a talk like this in the past, I usually start out with a question I think will be a kind of a softball for this crowd. Who here uses Bro? <laughs> um, so today I want to talk to you about some, a little bit of work that I've been doing primarily with Bro logs to kind of look at and prototype some ways of exploring that data in a different way, more visual oriented than uh, most of you might be used to. This talk has kind of three sections, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, I'm going to skip over my detailed bio. I don't really like that, um, talking about myself that much. But I will say that I currently work for a company based here in Cambridge called Squirrel. We do big data, security analytics, uh, relationship link data analysis stuff. But this is not a product talk. All the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, you can download from my GitHub or from some other some people uh, other people's GitHubs. But I've been doing like detection and response for probably about 15 years. I have some security uh, experience before that, but for about the 15 years, I've been focused on detection and response. And I learned a lot of what I know by working at this Fortune 5 cert. Um, I know a lot of people here um, are a fellow alums of that cert. So it was very, uh, very good experience for me where I learned how to deal with data from like hundreds of sensors and petabytes and terabytes of different kinds of data. My talk today has three sections. In the first section, I want to talk to you a little bit about what this idea of linked data is. And in the second section, I'm going to talk about how you can use linked data to do analysis of that linked data, to do some hunting through your, your uh, bro logs. And then in the third section, I'm going to show you about um, visualizing. So this is where my, my part of the, the tool stack comes in, uh, visualizing and working with the graph that your bro logs produce. So first of all, let's talk about what is linked data. So I did some Googling, and I found that um, there, there was this definition of linked data that a lot of people are using. It's a, a method of, what is it? A method of publishing structured data so that it can be interlinked and become more useful through semantic queries. Does anybody know what that means? Nobody. <laughs> Somebody. From my own company, yeah, definitely. Um, so I kind of wrote, rewrote this as a little bit more simple definition. Linked data is really just data that has connections to other pieces of data embedded in it. And you can have, in general, these connections can be uh, implicit connections or explicit connections, and I'm going to show you a little bit about those in the next few slides. So implicit links are links that you infer from the data. So here we have two different um, two different uh, uh, Unix syslog entries, and they may be related in some way. Oh, it looks like maybe they are. They have some implicit links, which you can kind of see here. Um, this one refers to, a, this is a snort alert, right? Sorry, bro guys. I, I did put a snort thing in here. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, and it's referring to, for example, port 22 on a certain box. Well, if you look here, there's an implicit connection. SSHD is the service that typically runs on port 22. You can also see, hey, I have a root logon detected, and here it says a password accepted for root, and the IP addresses and ports match up. So therefore, using some implicit linkage, you can infer that these two pieces of data are related. But we can do a little bit better than that. Um, if you were to look at this kind of visually, you would see a diagram that might look something like this. Here you have the two hosts, right? And they are connected with a relationship. So these two entities, we call them, or nodes, 
they're connected with a relationship called, well, connected. They made a network connection from one to the other. And I have another entity up here, which is the root username. And he's related to this entity with a logged into relationship. So here we've diagrammed what we saw in the two syslog entries a little bit more visually. So it shows the story of this host connecting to this host and logging in with this username. So that was implicit linkage. Bro, however, is a lot better at, it's great for linked data analysis, by the way, um, because the logs of Bro have explicit links between them. And this was done on purpose to make it easy to tie these rows of data together when you're trying to assemble them into some coherent picture. So here we have three different things that I'm sure everyone can, can, uh, is probably familiar with. So first we have, what kind of, what kind of record? Anybody guess? I heard it, somebody say it, who said it? Yeah, files log. And then I think everyone probably recognizes this. The second one is what? SMTP. And then the third one? Con. Yep, con logs, so connection logs. So we have three different pieces of log files. So there's three separate files. Um, but we have some explicit linkages. So bro, for example, I'm kind of telling everybody probably what they already know, has the, the connection IDs here that explicitly tie each one of these three things together. So you can grep for the connection ID and find everything that had to do with that connection. It also does the same for the file ID. So in the file transfer log, it saw this C file, and it assigned it to a, a unique ID. And then it says, hey, this unique ID was actually part of the email record that we saw, I guess an attachment. So Bro has explicit linkages, which turn out to be great for us. So if we diagram what we just saw, we will see, for example, a connection record, the bro connection, and here's the connection ID. And it's related to this uh, file transfer transaction and it had, it, by a contains operation. So this connection contained a transaction, a file transfer transaction. It might not be the only thing it contains, right? Because obviously that connection also contained the SMTP traffic that we saw. But uh, for this purpose, we're, we'll just focus on the file transfer. And we have some other things too. So because we have the connection record, we now have the source and the destination. So they're both connected to the connection transaction entity with the source and dest relationships. But we also have the file transfer um, transaction is related to the actual file object with a, what did I call this, the contains? Yeah, the contains operation. So here we start to see a little bit of visually of the structure of what that bro log is showing. Now, this is pretty much how the bro log is, sh is showing it, but it, sometimes it's a little bit um, clunky to do everything directly through these transactions. The transactions are pretty valuable. We'll see it a little bit. But we also can do some what we call the transitive closure of some of these to create some direct relationships between the two entities. So if you want to look at, did this guy connect to this guy, you can just look for the connected relationship without having to go all the way through the, the transaction. And you can see that the file transfer, uh, the file that was transferred also is related to these two. So there's this guy sent the file and this guy received the file. And notice all these have directions on them. It actually shows more visually that the file came from here to here. So do you have any questions so far? If you have one event and a unique identifier, um, what's the chances that that unique identifier is repeated, in your opinion? 
Oh, you mean the like the bro connection IDs? I don't know whether or not that happened. I mean, given the... enough transactions, it will repeat, but that's a really large space. So, given that you usually don't search all your bro records from like you know the past ten years, you know, the the chances of it occurring in a certain time window uh, is probably not very high. And usually, I discount them. No, I, it has not happened to me yet. Has it happened to you? Okay. <laughs> Even an option to increase the space, because it, it an has option to increase the space. Okay, I didn't know for that. For the 64-bit, it has, has actually happened to people. Okay, but it's we have increased it since, and you can increase it further. I think. So Robin says you can make it bigger if you think that that's going to have a chance of happening to you. So that's cool. All right. So that's what linked data is. Now let me try to get you a little bit excited about using linked data for hunting or even for you know, alert analysis or any of these kind of investigative tasks that analysts do. This is probably how you might be using bro data or, or something similar today. And in this example, I'm, I'm just using grep. And I'm making, I'm making good use of the fact that it has those connection IDs so I can grep out the connection ID and tell, you know, get all the things that are related. You might not actually be using grep. You might be doing a little bit more complicated version of this with like Elsa or Splunk or something. Who's, by the way, anybody actually just using grep on their bro logs? Okay, still a fair amount. Splunk or Elsa or something. Who's doing something else? Okay, cool. Come talk to me after. I want to know what something else is. Uh, yeah, and bro cut. Yeah, bro cut. So this is probably how you're doing it right now. So row-oriented techniques, um, and there's nothing wrong with those. I'm a big fan of just being able to like grep through the data. You, those of you, have, if if you've ever participated in an investigation with me, you'll probably have seen like I might have pasted in some really complicated command line, possibly involving a Perl script entirely on the command line or some awk or something. Uh, yeah, I. I I'm a big fan, so you won't hear me saying anything like, oh, you should never do this uh, you know, line-oriented stuff. It's really useful sometimes. But it does have some, some disadvantages. So if you see here, we're basically showing two different views of the same data. I, my whole thing is I want to be able to have different analytic techniques in my pocket that I can pull out when the circumstances warrant. So one technique, sure, is I want to be able to grep or, or use Elsa or something to inspect all my logs and do searches. But sometimes it's a lot easier to see what is going on if I can use some kind of visual representation over here. So I could read all these logs, but it's just kind of a wall of text. And it takes a long time to get, and you have to get your brain around it all. But sometimes just taking it out and rendering it with the, with the links in it uh, visually can show you a little bit more of a story at a glance. So like I said, there's nothing wrong with row-oriented analysis using logs. Uh, it has some real advantages. I mean, for one thing, um, there's a lot of tool sets out there already that you can get for, you know, for free or, for, or commercial that are really good at it. In fact, in some cases, with like grep and awk and Perl and Python, you don't really need tools per se because they probably already come on your analyst workstation if you have like a Mac or a Linux or something. Uh, so it's not like you actually need special tools. But it does have some disadvantages. Sometimes it's hard to see the big picture. Um, I, I used one of these search engine kind of things for a really long time as the main way of looking at logs. And I can tell you it's a wall of text sometimes. And it's hard to get your brain around it. And then you bring another analyst over for a second pair of eyes. And he, they have to spend like 10 or 15 minutes sometimes just ex figuring out what it is that you're showing. Not to mention that it's sometimes hard to figure out how you got to the exact set of rows that you're showing 
because if you're using something like Elsa or Splunk, you know, you're typing something and then you're refining the query and you're typing something again and pivoting through whatever. And it's just, you know, kind of difficult to do. Um, but this is, a, this is the kind of tool where when you want to do text searches or counting, and certainly when you want to extract the actual proof, the detailed proof of what happened, you need to go to the original logs. But that's not the only way that you can look at the data. So if you're looking at linked data analysis, for one thing, you have the opportunity to roll up a bunch of different logs into one entity or one relationship. So you might think of, well, this IP address appears 20,000 times in my log files for the day, but if I view it as a graph that is only one entity, it might have a lot of relationships for the things it participated in, but it's only one node on the graph, so it's a little bit compacted. Um, the visual way of representing that data allows you to get a lot of information into your brain through your eyeballs, which is one of the best ways to, to get information. And we are programmed, really, as visual people. More than probably any of our other senses, some, seeing something as a picture can relay a lot of information to us. And it also, the linked data analysis also allows you to take you know, decades of computer science research into graph, graph theory, graph computations, and, and apply those to your skills, uh, your, um, your analysis. So you can look for patterns like triangles that might mean some interesting relationship that you're looking for. Um, you might use uh, like centrality or, or page rank algorithms to kind of identify which nodes might be the most important ones that you're working with in your investigations. And uh, instead of pivoting like you would with Elsa or Splunk or something through log files manually to try to trace down a chain of like, I found this IP, it's related to this host name, and it's related to this user, uh, which is a bunch of searches, you might even be able to use a, a pathfinding algorithm to just say, show me the you know, the shortest path from this IP to a user during that time window and have the graph figure it out for you. So there's actually a lot of uh, computer science -y tools that are really useful for us but that we're not really used to using because our current tool sets are not linked. So here I'm showing the graph view of what you would get with a typical IDS or SIM or something alert where you basically just have an IP address and you have uh, the message of the IDS alert and you have another IP address, a source and a destination. Probably not too much beyond that. But when you start throwing it into a graph with all the other links that you've collected over time, now you can start to tell a little bit of a better story about what's happening. So here we have the same pattern of the alert the source, the alert, and the destination. But now notice we can query the graph kind of automatically and just say, like, what are the relationships? Well, this host, the source of the IP address, is related to this host name node and with the resolves to. So right there, you can tell the host name of that IP address. You probably can also go through like the Windows login records to find out who's logging into that IP address. Anybody ever have any problems figuring out what computers are the IP addresses in your logs? Nobody? You guys are all wizards at asset identification then. I feel humbled. I can say the first like year and a half probably that I worked for that Fortune 5 cert, this was our biggest challenge. It wasn't getting the network monitors up. It was trying to figure out who owned the assets. But now with the uh, with the graph, the linked data analysis, we can just observe all that stuff and compile our graph, and we can actually use a really simple graph algorithm that says, you know, find me a path to a username. There it is. That's it. Uh, on, the, on the destination of the alert, you can also see it's, uh, it's associated with this domain name as it resolves to, probably because we observed it in DNS logs, most likely. 
and you can see that there's an HTTP transaction connecting these two guys where he you know, requested a certain um, uh, resource from the server, received a certain file, and there may be their user agent that they, that they showed. So you can kind of see that just throwing your, your IDS alert into the graph and looking at a few simple relationships gives you visually a picture of what happened. Somebody you know, on this 10.hosts went out to the purpledaily.com site and downloaded some malware. So for the last part of the presentation, I want to talk to you a little bit about some real, real world-ish examples. I say ish because I had to use a really old data set so that I could have something public to show. But it was real world-ish. Um, I want to show you about how we can use your bro logs, import them, convert them to a graph, and start doing visual analysis of them. I used a bunch of different things that you can do, uh, you can use when you go back to your office. And here's a list. You don't have to write all this down because they're going to make the slides public um, after the conference and it, you can get my slides. But uh, I wanted to call out what I'm using to do all this stuff. So first of all, I'm using the DARPA 99 uh, challenge data set. If you're not familiar with that, it was... You know, in 1999, DARPA said, hey, we need to do a better job monitoring our networks. We want to put out a challenge for researchers and companies to do something better. Here's a big, giant uh, data set of like five weeks of data. Um, some of it is labeled for training, and some of it is not. And it has bad things in it. We will tell you what the bad things are after you submit your analysis results to us, and we'll see how you did. And they made all this available. As a side note, I would say this is probably still one of the most used data sets, and that's pathetic. <laughs> I don't know about your network, but my network looks a lot different now than it did in 1999. Yeah, yeah, it, it, even, it even looked different then than what this data set is. Uh, I, I'm totally convinced that if somebody wants to make a startup that will make a lot of money, they should make a startup that can produce realistic data sets for all the security analytics companies to buy. So anybody out there who is looking for a new business plan, uh, you, you want to take that, come see me, because we probably want to be one of your customers. Um, but this is, the best, you know, this is uh, the best one that I could find that had a realistic enterprise data that was also public that I could share. So you can, you can download that from the MIT website here. Um, and then, of course, we use this thing called Bro, you might have heard of it, um, to, to create the, the logs from the PCAP, the actual link data. And then you come down to, to my script, which you can get off GitHub, which is just some Python utilities that do simple things like convert it into a graph and then load that graph into a front end so that you can do something with it. That graph back in, I'm, I'm using the Rexter um, database from the Tinkerpop stack. It's a very simple database by default, just exists in memory, although you can actually use the Tinkerpop stuff to uh, plug in a real database uh, on the back end if you're interested. Um, the Python um, bulb flow module, that is the interface to uh, calling the Tinkerpop stuff from Python. And then I use this thing called Gephi. Anybody in, in here, by the way, just in, ever used Gephi before or heard of it? A few people, yeah. So Gephi is this really cool graph analysis package. It doesn't really, it's not domain specific to security or anything like that, but if you have some kind of linked data or some kind of graphs, you load them into Gephi. Gephi is a very convenient front end for doing all kinds of visualization and analysis on those graphs. It even has APIs and things that you can you can use. Um, I use a couple of, um, plugins by default to, um, which I list here, um, that give colors to nodes based on the data in the graph and also streaming the graph data so that I can get it from my Rexter database into Gephi in the first place. But anyway, uh, this, is, this is the stack that we'll be using in the next several slides. 
I wanted to try to work in a demo, but I'm always afraid of giving demos at conferences because they never work right. So instead of giving a live demo, what I did was I used this stack to produce some screenshots that we will talk about. So here's the first screenshot. This is the DARPA 99 challenge data set, just all of it, right? Not that useful just by itself, by default, just showing everything. But they're all color coded, so you can, the different types of nodes are different colors. So you can kind of get a rough visual idea of what you're seeing. So for example, um, there's these little red dots here and there that are the hosts in the data. Um, there's like this blue HTTP transactions scattered all around. The yellow things are files. Don't, you don't have to know all this. Um, if you look at my GitHub, by the way, there's a, in the readme, there's a color chart so you can see what these all are. Um, and there's a bunch of other things in here too. Not that I'm expecting that you will get so much from this because this is kind of messy, but it does give you like a visual idea of where the traffic patterns are um, and what those traffic, what that traffic might be. So you'll see oh, it's a lot of HTTP up there. But what usually is better, instead of graphing everything all at once, is to restrict what you're, gra what you're gonna graph down to maybe one or two node types at first and then grow as you have questions. You can add different node types that might help you answer those questions. So let's see. The first thing I did was just say, well, show me all the, all the hosts, all the IP addresses that are in my data set. So you can kind of start seeing some interesting features. This, is a, this layout is called a, it's a, called a force-directed layout, which means that things closer together are generally more closely related somehow um, than things that are farther apart. So you can kind of see a little bit of structure here that's interesting. Also, the sizes of the nodes represent, uh, in this case, they represent the number of connections that that node participates in. It's called the degree. So the larger degree, the larger the node. And you can kind of see like these big two up here, the connection between them is also by a number of connections that were observed. So I, if there's a thousand connections, I don't draw a thousand lines. I just draw one line and I say the value of this line is a thousand and it's, and it's weighted. Uh, so this is this big thick line with these two giant nodes. There's some lot of repeated tra you know transactions going on. Um, all these hosts though are the same color right now because by default I color all of the nodes red if they're IP addresses. So what we might want to do is do something that we call partitioning the graph, which basically says show me the same thing, but I'm going to color the graph differently depending on some criteria of the nodes. So what I did was when I ran this, I loaded into Bro, of course, the local nets so that Bro can tell me, was this a local host or was it a remote host or in some cases things that it just didn't know about. So green is a local host, red is an internet host, and all these um, um, gray ones are mean that Bro didn't have an opinion one way or the other. So if it's red, Bro explicitly said it was false. But these other ones, it, it might not know because maybe they didn't appear in the, the one or two types of logs where they actually have the local host flag. And, but you can see a little bit better of a picture now, we, which shows that the local host here, the 172.16, whatever, connecting to an internet host, and all those connections, remember this is these have directions on them, it's a directed graph. All those connections are based outward, which is probably a little bit of good news. It would be a little bit worrisome maybe um, if it was the other way. So, but that being the biggest source of stuff, maybe that would be a good place to start trying to figure out what's going on there. So what I did was I took the same hosts, but then I, I put in, the file transfers, figuring if there's a connection, it, it would be very likely that it was some kind of file transfers going on there. And, it, and in fact, it was. In this diagram, you can still see the two, the green and the red hosts, but now they're part of like this dandelion looking thing. 
where all the red, all, excuse me, all the yellow things are the file transfers transactions, the files that were transferred. So now you see there's a lot of file transfers going between these two guys. So what are those files? So what I did was I zoomed down into that cloud and I can now inspect the, the MIME types, is what I have it showing, the MIME types of what all those files are, which makes it clear that I'm seeing tons of images, JPEGs, GIFs, PNGs, um, and a few HTML as well. So this is probably all web traffic. Now, I could click some more on these things to try to find out like what web traffic this is, um, you can inspect with Gephi, you can pretty much click on any node and inspect all the information associated with it. And there is a lot, like everything that the bro log had, if it was a file name or a hash or whatever, is on these, on these nodes. So you can drill down into them and get everything that the bro log had about those. Um, but I really didn't feel a need to do that in this part of the investigation because I said, well, this looks consistent with regular HTTP traffic. I don't see, it's not like I see a bunch of, uh, you know, documents or uh, source code files that I would be concerned with going out to the internet. It's, it's mostly just images and HTML. Uh, you may also, you can't really see it from this, but um, the directions on all those arrows for the yellow nodes, the files, show that most of them are coming from the internet going to the server. So it's not like we're sending a lot of files out. We're sending requests and receiving a lot of files. So at that point, I'm thinking, well, this is fine. I'm, not, I'm no longer really interested in this traffic so much. It's not something terrible that's going on. So you can actually just filter those pieces out. And when you do that, it makes the rest of the graph a little bit more clear. We went from this graph and I filtered all of the web traffic kind of stuff out. And now we have a, a lot more reasonable looking graph. What's left is really much simpler um, and it's filtered out a whole category of traffic that we might not care about. So any, any files that are left on here are probably not just pure HTML or image files. They're probably something else. Um, and I don't really have time to do a full investigation through this data set, but this is the loop that you go through, that the, usually the way I recommend it when you're just exploring the data. Find the biggest things that can have the most impact on simplifying your graph. Check those out. Ideally, if everything is fine, filter them out, come up with a simplified graph and do this again. You might add some different node types in if you have some other questions. Um, in this case, I was mostly working with hosts and uh, file transfers, but that's not the only thing you can do. So there's a lot of different node types that we have in the graph, and sometimes it's really interesting to plot different ones against each other. So here's a, 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 like a bonus use case um, where I took the HTTP transactions in green and plotted them along with the uh, eight unique user agent values, which are hard, a little bit hard to see, but these uh, brown dots right in the middle. So this is effectively showing the common user agents and the uncommon user agents kind of visually. Yeah, you could stack these in a Splunk query or something and get them by numbers, but sometimes it's easier to see visually or show it to your boss visually what you're talking about. In this case, um, you know, one, one analysis path might be, well, here's the biggest bloom up here at the top. Let's see if that user agent is a legitimate user agent for our company. Uh, a lot of organizations, if you have standard builds, many of your people will be on the same user agents, the same few, uh, and then you can filter those out. And then maybe what's left, there's some really, uh, really sparse ones here, here, and those might be worth check, just checking out at least to see if there is anything interesting. Uh, you kind of expect to see those big groups. The small groups might be leads for you in this case. So um, that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I, uh, I hope that 
I've given you a little bit of a flavor of why it might be useful to take your bro data, your linked data, and bring it into a graph backend, either for visualization or, or which I did not talk about a lot, um, it brings in the ability to do a lot of graph algorithms, pathfinding, and, and centrality, and things like that, uh, which maybe I'll cover in a future presentation. Um, but uh, hopefully now you, you're all excited about trying this out with some of your own data. Who's excited? Vern's excited. Oh, you have a question. Oh, you're not excited. You just have a question. All right. What should we have in our heads is scalability for this. What, what can you throw in it before you regret that you threw that much at it? So let me, let me be totally honest. If you throw very much data at my tool, you will be sorry. <laughs> uh, you would probably be you would probably be very happy if you had a kind of smallish data set, like maybe a few hours out of a really large uh, set of logs, or if you have a smaller set, it might be a day or something. Uh, but a starting point, then that'll be small enough to. Yeah, sure. You could take a subset of the logs for whatever reason that you wanted to have. Um, but that's just my implementation of it. So I don't really want to go into like a product talk, but I mean, this is what my company does on a commercial side. And we're in Hadoop. So I mean, the, the techniques are not limited by my crappy code. The techniques can have, you know, you can have petabytes of data in it without really any issue. Yes? Can you describe some of the things that are going on in your tool that takes the bro log to a graph? You know, to what degree are you doing just um, implicit, explicit links, and how are you finding the uh, implicit links? And are you using any machine learning to uh, infer connections that are a little bit further away, or is it just transitive closure, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so the question is, it uh, boils down to how does my script work? And am I smart enough to do machine learning or not? And the, the answer to the section, the second one is no. I don't, I don't try to do machine learning in that one. Um, but basically, the, the script is actually really simple. It reads in a bunch of bro logs, optionally uh, does a random sample of them. That's kind of to get to your point, Vern, about how much can you actually put in. If you have a really large data set, you could do a random sample just to kind of get that visual overview without showing everything. Um, but it takes in the bro logs, and it goes through several of the files, the, the, the con logs, the file logs, DNS logs, the HTTP logs. I, I plan to expand this out a little bit uh, over time. And it takes each one of those rows and says, well, I see the IP address. Do I find that IP address already in the graph? If I do, then I can add my data to the existing node. And if I don't, then I can create a new node. And then the same with the relationships. It's like I see this, whatever relationship is, like in the con log, it will be a connected relationship between two hosts. Do I see that relationship already existing in my graph? If I do, I have a counter on that relationship, and I just make the counter you know, increment it by one. If I don't see it, then I can create. But, and, and it's very simple. I don't want to say it's dumb, but it kind of is dumb. Uh, the, the complexity there is just in the sheer number of node types and relationship types that you have to get right, rather than, uh, at this point, trying to do uh, machine learning. But I do the transitive closure piece. So you will see a lot of things that the, the hosts are connected to a, a transaction, but then I also, in the code, say, well, when you have this transaction, you also should just create a direct relationship between the two sides of the transaction as well. Sometimes it's useful to view the transactions and the hosts associated with them, but sometimes you just want to show the aggregate of like the connection. If I had a thousand connections between two hosts, I'd have one connection in the transitive closure part, but I would have like a thousand different nodes for the transactions, and sometimes that's not what you want. So you can kind of take your choice when you're working with the graph. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so for uh, the link data analysis graphs that you had initially, is that something that you had to uh, compose manually by interpreting the data, or can you do that automatically through your tool? You mean like the cartoony ones at the beginning yeah. of the... Yeah, I just uh, drew those. I just drew those. You, the tool could uh, do that. It's really down to Gephi. Gephi can do everything, honestly. 
Um, and you could generate similar things with Gephi. They wouldn't look exactly the same. They would actually look better because it has really nice layouts. Yes? One slide from the user. Um, yes. So uh, this is a common slash question. How useful slash feasible would it be for you to place the nodes based on the deviation between the two different user agents? For instance, if you have one user agent that's very common, it might be useful to see things are slightly different, possibly in hacker typoid. Yeah. I'm going to play the user agent and place that right next to the big node. That is a fabulous idea that I never thought of, but um, I think it's a great idea. You could do that. I think um, the way that I've structured it right now, the user agents themselves are not related to the other user agents. So you could potentially do it with some kind of um, like a, a distance algorithm there. Or you could possibly do it uh, at the Gephi presentation layer with like a plugin or something. But uh, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that that's a really interesting analytic use case that I hadn't thought of. So thanks for. Be sure to to submit a pull request. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Uh, it, it, it kind of seems like. Um, this would lend itself well to uh, some other tools. Did you look at other tools? I'm thinking Maltigo in particular, taking bro data and putting it in Maltigo in some way, may lend itself to doing this and add enrichment, which Gephi may not necessarily have. Uh, yes, you could do that. Since I work for a company that makes a product that's not Maltigo, I will say, <laughs> If you want to know why that might not be the best choice, you can talk to me after. There's, there's, um, but the short answer really is that Mal Maltigo is not really oriented towards, you know, siloing all your data. It's, it's an analysis tool that's valuable, but it won't silo all your data. Um, this is a small, tiny toy silo. Although with a little bit of work, you could actually hook up a real graph database in the back of it. And I think if you probably did that, you would not be happy with going back to Multigo for that piece of it. All right, I might have time for one more question if there is one. Yes, there's one all the way in the back. Um, so using more direct graphs, you're, you're showing similarity. Have you ever thought about um, reversing that and using something like Primus to look at unrelated sets to filter out things as you go through an analysis? Yeah, kind of like the, um, this, the question is, I'm using force-directed graphs to show things that are similar. Um, could you kind of like flip that around and show things, the layout showing things that are dissimilar, right? Did I get that right? Well, yeah, so an example would be, you know a potential IP address of interest or a potential or signature of interest here, and then filter out everything that's the maximum unrelated set by using ah. something like Primus to then allow you to then regroup and look at the directed relatedness of the remaining nodes. Yeah. My tool does not do that explicitly, but it is something that I have um, been working on. I'm working on it in the, the, the context of you have an alert that gives you one or two data points in your graph, and you want to find those in your graph and then find the relationships, kind of like the, the, the diagram I showed before, where it showed like the most important <laughs> local relationships to those things. They give you the context of that alert. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. Even though my tool doesn't really do that right now, that is something that a graph backend uh, is very well suited for, and it is definitely something that I, I want to uh, be able to do. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate it.